By the spring of 1942, the German armies were deep into Soviet territory, but a victory was nowhere in sight. Hitler had outlined his new plan for his war in the East, codenamed Fallblau. In this video, you will learn about the German perspective on their summer offensive of 1942, from German high command to the individual soldier on the ground. Welcome back to the channel. If you are new, my name is Stefan. I'm a Dutch history teacher. I make videos about history. If you find it interesting, consider subscribing and also hit that notification bell. The German led Axis forces invaded the USSR on the 22nd of June 1941. By the time the German armies reached Moscow, they were worn down and a vicious Soviet counterattack drove them back, almost annihilating Army Group Center. The Germans dug in for the winter. Will this winter never end? Is a new glacial age in the offing? Goebbels asked himself in late March 1942. Hitler came up with a new plan that, by the end of that year, towards October, had to bring Germany into a good position to wage a long war against the Americans. Now, you, the United States was still battling the Japanese in Southeast Asia, and a second front in Europe hadn't developed yet. Germany could no longer play the waiting game, if it ever could. There were two options, ending the war politically, which Hitler refused, or to get the raw materials to continue a long war. As Goebbels stated in an article in the newspaper Das Reich, that it was an ideological war, but also a war for raw materials. Oil was the key, according to Hitler. It would boost the German war effort and throw the Soviet war economy into disarray. As Hitler stated that once the business in the East was over, then the war is practically won for us. Then we will be in the position of conducting a large-scale pirate war against the Anglo-Saxon powers, which in the long run they will not be able to withstand. In Führer Directive number 41, which Hitler signed early April 1942, he declared the ultimate goal to secure the Caucasian oil fields and the passes through the mountains themselves. The aim was to siege for Anesh, destroy enemy forces west of the Don and march to the Volga after having neutralized the industrial and communication center that bore the name Stalingrad and gaining control over the Volga, the German troops could move into the Caucasus. The command structure was somewhat different from what we saw during Operation Barbarossa. During the first Blitzkrieg campaigns, German generals were given orders and had the freedom in how they were carried out. Now this wasn't the case. The German command structure now was more rigid. It would eventually result in chaos. As with the Blitzkrieg of the previous summer, it was an all-or-nothing gamble on a short campaign, but in the spring of 1942, the discrepancy between his aims and his military power was even greater than the year earlier. The Germans had to do more with less, as they had already lost over 1 million men. In late April, German commander Halder estimated that the infantry units of Army Group South were 50% of their original strength. Army Group North and Center only 35%. The Germans had to rely more on their allies, such as Italy, Romania and Hungary, some of which didn't rely on one another, such as the Romanians and the Hungarians. I read that the Italians had to be placed between the Romanian and Hungarian units. All of these nations could marshal far fewer resources than those of the enemy coalition. And on top of that, Hitler believed that the Soviet armies were on their last legs and that a few more encirclement campaigns were needed to defeat the Red Army for good. German analysis misjudged the extent of the Soviet industrial production and moreover, the Soviets could count on land lease aid from the US. Hitler understood the risks but had no choice. As German General George Thomas noted in May 1942, if it proved impossible 1942 to defeat Russia definitively or at least get as far as the Caucasus and the Urals, Germany's war situation must be judged as extremely unfavorable, if not hopeless. Historian Stefan G. Fritz put it like this. Hitler now placed his hopes on a similar throw of the dice, but with even less chance of success. 
Yet, most German army officers were not that gloomy. American historian Robert Cetino links this to the Prussian German military tradition. It was all a matter of will, they felt. If you didn't think you were beaten, you weren't. And if you didn't think you were going to be beaten, you wouldn't be. The stronger will could vanquish even the larger battalions. Operation Blue started on the 28th of June 1942. One German infantryman was stationed near the Meus River, one of the southeasterly points of the Eastern Front. They were one of the last to hear about the upcoming summer offensive. This infantryman was annoyed by the fact that they had spent so much time on training instead of attacking, but now they had to move forward. When during time off, they were watching a comedy movie, and he realized laughter had become rare amongst us. If you think that pretty much every one of them has at least 10 Russians on his conscience, you do have to wonder a bit at this boisterousness. On the left of July, the order came to move forward. Wading across the Mias River, they arrived at a Soviet village, which was already abandoned by the Red Army. However, several hundred meters further, they run into enemy fire. They had to dig in, and by the second day, they hadn't eaten for 48 hours. Finally, relief came, and when this happened, an incoming shell tore off the legs of one of his comrades. Back in the rear, there was no hot food. They had to do with bread, some butter, and coffee. They marched further south towards Rostov. They marched only at night to avoid the hot July sun. Another German soldier wrote on the 18th of July, 1942. I believe our target for now is Stalingrad, at least that's what I got from soldiers in the tank unit. In our sector, the Russians are running so fast that we can't keep up with them with our vehicles. And our daily marches don't lie, 50 to 120 kilometers. When will we arrive in Iraq? It's interesting that this German soldier refers to the possible capture of the Middle East. It was an idea Hitler did find intriguing, but was abandoned because it was far from realistic. Speaking of the lack of realism, the soldier continues. I just heard that Stalingrad had fallen. That would be great. Our tanks had been standing in front of the city for a few days and could not continue due to the lack of fuel. Everything already depends on the available fuel, which we will find in abundance in Baku. Stalingrad hadn't fallen, that was for sure. And Baku was over 1,000 kilometers away. But at least he's not aiming for Iraq any longer. All jokes aside, what does this show? Well, first off, it shows that soldiers, of course, relied on rumors, since the only other sources they had were propaganda newspapers. Second, it does show morale is high. And thirdly, he refers to the lack of fuel, because that hindered this operation a lot and caused countless of traffic jams. Okay, back to the first mentioned German infantrymen who had now arrived at Rostov and Don. The city was taken by the Germans towards the end of Operation Barbarossa, but was retaken by the Soviets after a successful counteroffensive. and during the summer offensive of 1942, the Germans took the city again. They then crossed the Don River and marched across the steppe. The rearguard Soviet troop states met surrendered immediately. However, the bulk of the Soviet army wasn't captured as these retreated further east. Historians still this day argue whether or not this was an organized retreat or a chaotic route. If you have any ideas, feel free to leave them in the comments. The amount of Soviet POWs was a huge difference compared to Operation Barbarossa. During Barbarossa, millions of red army soldiers were captured. Now it were only tens of thousands. A similarity with Operation Barbarossa were the endless marches, as one infantryman wrote. Completely exhausted and overstrained, eyes burning for sleep, nerves totally overstrung. As Fault Blau was launched on the 28th of June 1942, it would originally take three stages. First to capture Voronezh, then encircling the Soviet forces in the Great Bend of the Don, and then 
advanced towards Stalingrad and Astrakhan to protect the left flank. Capturing the city of Stalingrad wasn't necessary as long as the German guns could prevent the Soviets from using it as a base of communication and armaments. Initially, it went well. Voronezh was taken and Rostov fell. Rostov was seen as the gateway to the Caucasus and the oil fields of Maikop and Grozny. Hitler claimed, if we don't take Maikop and Grozny, then I must put an end to the war. Hitler deviated from his plan by Führer Directive number 45 on July 23rd. Army Group A would move to the Caucasus and B would go for Stalingrad, the city that bore Stalin's name. Speaking of Stalin, on the 28th of July, Stalin ordered order number 227 not a step back where panic mongers and cowards were to be destroyed on the spot. It is beyond the scope of this episode since I'm focusing on the German perspective, but I did want to mention it. Around that time, Paul's 6th Army that was moving towards Stalingrad came to a standstill because of the immediate lack of supplies. Apart from the fact that Army Group South was stripped of forces that were sent to Army Group North and aid in the attack on Leningrad, Army Group A was prioritized. It was not until the 7th of August Paulus could go on again. At dawn on the 21st of August, German forces crossed the Don in assault boats and secured a bridgehead. Soon, pontoon bridges were built so armored units could cross. On the 23rd of August, Stalingrad underwent a massive bombardment. As Stalingrad was burning from a distance, German soldiers celebrated it and took pictures. In a short time, they had managed to get from the Don to the Volga and consider this to be the border of Asia. Many believe the war was as good as over, as one tank commander who stood on top of his pincer wrote. We looked at the immense step towards Asia and I was overwhelmed, but then I could not think about it for very long because we had to make an attack against another anti-aircraft battery that started firing at us. The battles that came as a result from Falblau were the battles for the Caucasus and the Battle of Stalingrad. I hope to cover these in the future. Operation Blue was enormous and therefore it a little bit ambitious to cover this in a single episode. Topics like the Battle of Voronezh, Kalash as well as the road to Stalingrad. Well, I hope to cover these one day on location. So if you can support me, I can make that happen. You can support me via PayPal and via Patreon. The links are in the description. Big shout out to my patrons, a special thanks to Philip Jordan, Jakob Mosland, Nick Terranova, Haley Berry, Mark Little Hill, Janusz Dojom Kievis, Joan, Justin Trebel, Peter King, Tanya Dixie, Henry Clarkson, Rob Park, Andrea Martic, Ilya Yut, Fernando Lopez Ojeda, and Mike West. If you want to share some additional information, go all out in the comments. And if you haven't seen the other episodes about the German perspective on World War II, I have a playlist for you. You can find it right here. I want to thank you for watching. Please subscribe and share. And until next time.